Welcome to Bridges Community Church. And whether you're joining us online or live in person, we would like to say thanks for joining us. And remember, it doesn't matter what you've been through in your life. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with or what you're going through right now. You are welcome here and you are in the right place. We will begin our services in just a few moments. And as we prepare to enter into a time of worship, we would just like to say we would love to connect with you. If you're new with us, head to bridges.info and let us know that you're here and we'll reach out this week and find out how we can be praying for you or how we can help get you connected to our community. Welcome to Bridges Community Church. Thank you for joining us for worship today. If you've been around Bridges for any length of a time, any length of time, you're looking up here and you probably already noticed the worship team looks just slightly different today. And I will tell you that we are in for a treat. If you haven't been here for any length of time, if you're visiting us for the first time today, my name's Nate. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. We'd like to say Welcome. Thanks for joining us. This is the worship team from Abundant Life Christian Fellowship. Let's welcome them this morning. These are my new friends. This is Junior here. And uh, for those of you that know, don't know, Abundant Life has been meeting here in this worship center at 4.30 on Sunday afternoons. And Junior and I were talking and we said, hey, how about we trade teams? So they're here this morning. Our usual worship team is going to be leading for Abundant Life at 4.30 this afternoon, and we are so excited for that. Y'all are in for a treat. Let me get out of the way, and let's worship with the Abundant Life Christian Fellowship worship team. Thank, Thank you, you, Pastor Nate. Nate is awesome. You know what? Your church, through Pastor Nate, your church is exactly what it is, Bridges Community Church, and I love it that you guys portray what the body of Christ is like and building bridges, and that's why we're here. We wanna build bridges for, you know, forever, amen? And then when we get to heaven, it'd be like, what's up, dog? It's all good, is God good? Amen. All right, I come from a Pentecostal background, so when I say it's God good, y'all say? All the time. And all the time? God is good. God is good? All the time. And all the time? God is good. Come on, I invite you to stand to your feet. Stand here to your feet and in Engage with us, the presence of God. Is that all right?
marvelous God, church. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that today? Yes. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Amen. He called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light, and we continue our praise and our worship, just lavishing God with praise that is his due. In honor of that, he called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He is a great and marvelous God. Come on, man. Hallelujah.
created marvelous, amen. You know, I know some of us ain't been through enough to know that. But keep on living. A lot of our, uh, our elderly here and our older folks, y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen. Keep on living and you'll find out how marvelous and great the Lord is. When you've been through some things, look to your neighbor and say, I've been through some things. And I know how great and marvelous the Lord is. Amen. Amen. Let's continue in our time of worship. And sing this uh, modern hymn, if you will.
bless his holy name. Let's continue in our time of worship.
abundant life for being here. So I could preach a whole nother sermon. Uh, seriously, I'm just sitting here forming one. So don't start the clock just yet um, for whenever I'm supposed to start here. I couldn't have picked better songs, brother. Thank you for doing that. I don't know. It's almost like the Holy Spirit communicated because I didn't communicate Psalm 103 to you, but that's almost like God. Wait a second, that he would do something like that and put together the perfect song set um, for us. Sometimes, friends, we need our soul to be awakened, don't we? We need our soul to be awakened in such a way that if we don't come away from worship with a better sense of the greatness and the power and the provision of God, is that on God's shoulders or is that on us? What does that say about us? Our souls need to be awakened. And so thank you, brother. Thank you, team. We love you all. And you are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're grateful for this partnership that we've been able to have and hope for many, many more um, years to come. So we're going to do something a little bit different here with Psalm 103. Usually we bring somebody up here who reads the scripture text for the sermon, and uh, you all and I listen to this person uh, sort of read the text. We're doing this all together. Psalm 103 is the kind of psalm, we're going through a series here in the book of Psalms, we're going through various psalms. We're not going through all 150 psalms, but some of you have told me that Psalm 103 is your favorite psalm in all of the 150 psalms. Some of you have said Psalm 103 is your favorite chapter in all of the Bible. I love Psalm 103. I think we need to say this all together. So church, let's stand, and here's how we're going to do this. I'm dividing us into sections. This section here in the middle, okay, you all are going to be group one. I'm not saying team one, because it's not a competition, but there will be prizes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> group one, okay, you're going to be the color blue on the screen. Group two over here, everybody say group two, make sure you know, okay, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to reach across the aisle today, do a little bit of that. You all are going to be uh, in the red. So we got the blue states over here and the red states over here. No, we're, okay, we're not doing that. And then some of this we'll do all together. That's going to be in black. So we got blue and we got red. There's 22 verses. We got to practice this because this is what we'll be doing in heaven, but without all the kind of rehearsing and all over here. So let's show it. And hey, let's act like we're reading this for the first time. And let's say this like we really mean it. Okay. Like let's say these words, not like we're reciting, you know, a, a manual from the DMV. Like let's actually read this with our soul and with our spirit. So go on ahead and put it up there. We'll start off all together. Praise the Lord, all my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your, your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. And then all together, for as the eyes and the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Here we go, group one, as a father, has compassion on his children. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass 
They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. Group one. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Big finish. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. Give yourself a round of applause. And the Lord, a round of applause. You can have a seat. Great job, okay? We'll uh, rehearse that and have some more rematches maybe in the future. Aren't you glad we didn't do Psalm 119? It's like 172 verses. Like we'd be here for a long time. Now, as I mentioned, a few of you have told me how much you loved Psalm 103, and I love it too. But I'm calling this message, Don't Forget to Remember, because of verse 2, where it says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not. What are we to forget not? All of his, all of God's benefits. So this is largely a psalm, Psalm 103, about us not forgetting. It's about us remembering to not forget something. Speaking of remembering, a few years ago, a researcher coined a term that Shannon introduced me to recently called the Mandela Effect. How many of you have heard of the Mandela Effect? Some of you are going to do a deep dive after the sermon on the Mandela Effect. What, the, what it is most concerned with is when a person or a group of people remember an event or a detail from the past that never actually occurred. People remember details of things that never actually existed. It's suggesting we often have memories that don't actually match up with reality. And some of you are like, hello, I'm married to somebody whose memories don't match up with reality. <laughs> That's a different sermon altogether. But what the Mandela effect is meant to explore is how our brain processes memory and why we sometimes have false memories. For instance, if you show people a jar of Jif peanut butter. We got a picture up here on the screen of Jif peanut butter. I show this to you. You all would say, have you, you know, ha have you seen this? Yes, yes, we've all seen this jar of peanut butter. But if you don't have the jar of peanut butter and you just ask a person to recite different brands of peanut butter from the top of their head, inevitably when they come to this one, a lot of people will say, Jiffy. I like Jiffy peanut butter. And then you can actually point out to them, there's actually no such peanut butter as Jiffy. And they'll look at you like you have a third eye in your head. What are you talking about? I have Jiffy at home. I grew up on Jiffy. I love Jiffy. And then you show them the label and they're like, oh, I've never noticed that before. Maybe they're combining it with Skippy peanut butter in their head. I, I, I don't know. Okay, next Mandela ex, uh, effect. We're not going to show you the picture just yet, okay? I'm just going to ask you a question. We're not going to show it. Okay, I want you to think of Uncle Sam in your head. Okay, you got it? What is the color of his hat? Okay, you're thinking about it? You're not sure? Who says it's red and white? Who says it's red, white, and blue? All right, who says it's something else? Okay, let's show the picture here of Uncle Sam. It's blue and white. But in your mind, right, you're like, okay, got another experiment, okay? We got uh, the movie Snow White. Go on ahead and put it up here uh, on the uh, uh, slides here. Yeah, there she is, the queen from Snow White. A scarier movie now in retrospect to go back, but every, every day she goes to the mirror and she says something. What does she say? I grew up hearing that she says mirror, mirror on the wall, right? That's not what she says. She says magic mirror on the wall. I, I just always thought it was mirror, mirror. At no point does she say mirror, mirror on the wall. That's the Mandela effect at work. One more example. We have Freddie Mercury from the uh, uh, group Queen. I wanted to be the first pastor here in the history of this church <laughs> to be able to have a picture of Freddie Mercury on the screen. So I can check that off my resume here. But the song, We Are the Champions, 
We are the champions. We are the champions. We've all heard that song, or most of us have heard that song. What are the last three words of that song? We are the champions. No time for losers, because we are the champions. Those lyrics are not actually in the original recording of that song. We put them in there. Why? Because Freddie Mercury at Live Aid in 1985 put those words in there. But if you go back and listen to the recording, those three words are not there at the end of that song. That's the Mandela effect, okay? I, I'm telling you, you're going to go back and go do a deep dive. I've got lots of other examples of this. The point is that our ability to remember can sometimes play tricks on us. And on top of that, it's strange to also think about the kind... Yeah, just keep up Freddie Mercury. I like that. That's good. <laughs> It's strange for us to think about the kinds of things that we remember and the kinds of things that we forget. For instance, we remember the most random, inconsequential things, and we forget some of the most important stuff. Do we not? We'll forget people's names, which names are important. We'll forget addresses. We'll forget phone numbers. We'll forget birthdays, anniversaries, appointments. We'll forget that important thing that you promised to do. But Oh, ask me what the phone number of my friend Patrick from second grade is? 713-464-8758. I haven't talked to Patrick in, I don't know, like more than 30 years, okay? I, have, I haven't called Patrick. I, I, I don't know where Patrick is, but I know 713-464-8758. I know my mom's old office number from the late 70s, okay? 713-465-3408. I know my locker combination, 17, 32, 39. I can quote to you probably the entire movie of Three Amigos, which is quite a feat. It's a great movie. I know the lyrics from hundreds of songs from my youth, but I can't tell you what I talked about with that person last week. What's wrong with me? Why is this? Why do we remember what we remember and forget what we forget? We remember the unimportant stuff and we forget the stuff that is far more important. Well, as we read throughout the Bible, what we see, and in here in Psalm 103, is that God is uniquely concerned with our memory, with our ability to remember. That's why there are endless commands throughout Scripture to remember, to not forget God's deliverance, and his provision to remember his faithfulness through all generations, to call to mind his wonderful works in history. And in fact, an entire book of the Bible, a big book of the Bible, Deuteronomy, was created just to help us. Hey, people, remember. You need to remember. And it's an admonishment for all of us to be very careful to not forget God. It's a call to remember. And so that's what Psalm 103 is addressing. It's a problem. This is a problem for us. It's saying that you and I tend to be forgetful people, especially when it comes to God. It's saying that the main thing you and I need to do, okay, the main way for us to honor God, the main way for us to handle life is to not forget. It's saying that the big reason why we are often unable to handle the things that come our way, the reason why we so often deal with fear, despondency, or doubt, is precisely because we tend to forget. So Psalm 103 is saying, don't forget. Remember. But that word remember in Scripture doesn't just mean mental recall. It means something far more than just counting your blessings. Counting your blessings, so good. This is far more. Anytime you see remember, it's saying something else. We'll talk about that. So this particular psalm is going to teach us three things today. Why we need to remember where we need to remember and what we need to remember. Where we need to remember, what we need to remember, or excuse me, uh, how, why we need to remember where and then what. So first, why? Why do we need to remember? Now, this question wouldn't be as obvious if you're only reading Psalm 103, but if you zoom out and you look at all the different places in Scripture and look at a Bible concordance where it says either the word remember or forget, you'll come away going, oh, this must be really, really, really important to God. And the reason why we know that God is after more than just mental recall for you and for me is because when he tells us to remember, there are also numerous places in Scripture where God says that he remembers. He remembers his covenant with us. And it says that he also forgets. He forgets our sins, praise God. But because God is all-knowing and omniscient, we know that he doesn't just lack mental recall. It's not like he said, now I know Steve sinned back in 2019. I I can't recall what it is right now. God doesn't do that. So 
mere recall has to be kind of pushed to the side here. God is after more than just remembering mental recall wise. Rather, a better definition, I'm going to point this out here to you all today, that a way of thinking about remembering for us, the way Scripture means it, and I think it was Pastor Skip Heitzig in Albuquerque who first said this, I can't recall that for sure because I'm not remembering, but I think it was Skip Heitzig, that remembering in the Bible really has to do with controlling consciousness. Controlling consciousness. Remembering in the Bible is to have something so central to your consciousness that it affects you so thoroughly that it goes down to your behavior and it controls how you act. So when you say, I'll never do that again, how many of us have said that? I'll never do that again. And then you go back weeks or days or sometimes hours and then you do the exact same thing again. Is that because you've mentally forgotten that it's ever happened? No, it's because it was controlling you in the moment and was so vivid and it was so immediate and then broad color and it was gripping you in that moment and then that feeling went away with time. It's no longer central to your consciousness. You don't remember that feeling that you had. You've forgotten it. So the fact that we're told to remember and forget not so many times in scriptures is telling us something. Is that about us, even though we can mentally recall certain things, we almost immediately begin to forget. It means that there were things that are so important to us in a particular moment that they can begin to lose their sense of immediacy and their grip on us. This is why we need to remember. And sometimes we'll argue this idea. We'll point out all the awful or hateful things that somebody has said or done to you. Or maybe awful or hateful things you said or did to somebody that you'd absolutely love to be able to forget. But you just can't. It just has this hold on you. You don't just mentally recall it. You feel the sting that it brings. But that's actually part of the problem. The problem is that one of the effects of how sin so thoroughly works its way into our lives is that our memory gets all screwed up. In that the things that should keep you confident and should help you to remember God and be affirmed and all those things that keep your heart soft and humble are the kinds of things that immediately after you experience them, they fade. And meanwhile, the cruel and the awful and the hurtful things that should not be there, we don't want to be there, are there as vivid as can be. Think about it. Why does it take so many positive words or actions from someone to then counteract one negative word that somebody says or an action that they did to you? That person can apologize. They can try to make it up to you, tell you that you're not a bad person, but it just stays with you. Why? What's going on? It's because there's something wrong with our hearts. The heart of our problem is the problem of our hearts. And one of the problems we have with our hearts and our minds is that the good things, the best things, the noble things, the kinds of things that should be controlling our hearts and minds are immediately fading. And then the kinds of things that make us feel awful, rotten, and the things that end up controlling us. And they're just right there. So the Bible is telling us why we need to remember. It's telling us that our hearts naturally forget God. God is seemingly always saying in Scripture, you're going to forget me. It's why God perhaps repeats himself so often. Shannon's reading through the Bible in a year through the chronological Bible, and she often points out to me, why is there so much repetition in the Bible? Because we don't get it. It's why he often instructed his people, build an altar, build a monument. You cross the Jordan River, put some rocks there. Why? So that you don't forget. That's why we need to remember. It's why we need a psalm like Psalm 103. Where do we need to remember? where we need to remember is right there in verse 1 and verse 2 and verse 22. Praise the Lord, what? My soul. That's where we need to remember. My soul, that's the target. The psalmist, David, here is talking to his soul. The soul in the revival refers to our total being, the concept of our heart. So when we praise the Lord, oh my soul, when we bless the Lord, oh my soul, what are we doing? We are praising him with all that we have within us. We are praising him with all that we are, our whole hearts, everything. That is whole person worship. This is not like what we do, where I and perhaps some of you sometimes praise God with our lips 
And we go through the motions, but not really think about what it is that we're actually saying, and our hearts are not really into it. That ever happened to you? It's happened to me. So the kind of praise that David is bringing here from the depths of his soul in this psalm is not holding anything back. Praise the Lord, O my soul, is there's no lip service here, okay? You're not just going through the motions. You're not faking it. You're not just coldly reciting something like you're reading the Constitution. There's no outward forms and expressions of worship that don't go any deeper than just surface level. No, this is deep soul worship that we're talking about here. Nothing is held back, and you can't fake that with God. So why is David talking to his soul? It's because that's where our heart is. That's where the seat of our remembering is. It's in our soul. And it's also because it's in our soul, our inmost being, that we have unbelief. And so David in Psalm 103 is preaching to his heart. He's commanding his heart. This isn't a TED talk he's giving here. This isn't a lecture. He's talking. He's pleading. He's urging. He is arguing with his soul. And this is crucially important, I think, for us to figure out how can we then get over our problem of forgetting. It's a scientific fact that we're always talking to ourselves about something. Scientists call this self-talk. It's why Paul Tripp frequently says, the most influential person in your life is who? It's you. Why? Because nobody talks to you more than you talk to you. We're constantly talking to ourselves. Now, one researcher studied what he calls this sort of inner dialogue, meaning the words we say to ourselves, and he concluded in this report that the average adult speaks to themselves at an average pace of 4,000 words per minute. I, that sounds like a lot to me. I'm not really sure I buy that. I'm, I had this conversation with a couple people last night, and we're like, I don't know. That's like 10 times faster than verbal speech. I'm not sure. I guess maybe it makes a little sense because you don't have to use full sentences when you're talking to yourself because you already know what you mean. So I don't know. But what we, here's what we do know is that we talk to ourselves more than we talk to anyone else. And sometimes we're our own cheerleader, and we're talking ourselves into doing something difficult, or sometimes the conversation going in our head is negative or judgmental or destructive. And so what we're always telling ourselves is what we believe to be true. So that's what David is doing in Psalm 103. He's giving himself a pep talk. He needs his soul to be awakened. He's instructing his soul and hoping that it catches fire. It's as if he's saying to himself, come on, wake up, soul. Don't just go through the motions here. Wake up. This is important. You need to stop whatever else you're doing and focus and remember and forget not God and all of his benefits. So we've talked about why we need to remember. We've talked about where we need to remember in our soul because we're habitual forgetters. We hear the word, we pray, we may think about it, but it doesn't always penetrate into our inmost being. So this psalm is a wake-up call for all of us to recognize that if we are physically praying, physically reading the Bible, physically here in worship, and yet don't come away with a sense of God's greatness and presence, I said this earlier, then something is definitely wrong. That's what's wrong with us. Our souls have to be awakened all the way down to where it really affects us. So how do you praise the Lord, O oh, your soul? Notice the word and in verse 2. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. That's verse 2. That second phrase, forget not all his benefits, is not introducing a second thing. After the first phrase, praise the Lord, my soul, it's talking about the same thing. That word and is a connector. So in other words, how do you praise the Lord, O oh, my soul? By forgetting not all his benefits. That's how you praise the Lord, O oh, my soul by forgetting not all his benefits. And that takes us to what we need to remember. What do we need to remember? That's the rest of the psalm, verse 3 through 22. So everything else in this psalm from verse 3 through 22 is just an enumeration of all of God's benefits, which is the main thing we forget, all his benefits. Whenever a person gets a new job, we want to know about the benefits package. And the thing about the benefits package is if you do the work, then you're eligible theoretically, to receive the benefits package. Did you know the beautiful thing about Psalm 103 is that it is reminding us that God's benefits, which are greater than anything that any company can dole out, 
are available to God's people, and we don't have to do anything to earn them. You don't seem to be responding to that. <laughs> That's exciting. All of God's benefits, you don't have to do a thing to earn God's benefits. You don't have to do the work. What is the work? You don't have to struggle and strain. God in his mercy says, here are my benefits. Take and eat and enjoy. I don't deserve this. Do you deserve this? I don't. These are an expression of God's generosity and his mercy. So what do we need to remember? Remember all of his benefits. Don't just recall one of them and then move on to something else. What do we need to remember? All of his benefits. So I want us to walk back through this psalm. We're not going to take a long time to do this. And I encourage you to do this with me, not just listening to me, not just looking on your phone at something else right now, but by looking at the text with me. You've got Bibles in front of you in the pew if you didn't bring a Bible. Maybe you have an app on your phone. Maybe the person next to you will be nice and will share with you. But we are going to look through verse 3 through 22 and remember together all of God's benefits. We're going to rehearse these things. Here's a simple way for us to think about this. Okay, we're going to divide it like this. Verses 1 through 5 tells us what God is like. Verse 1 through 5 is what is God like. Verses 6 through 19 tell us what, oh, excuse me, verses 1 through 5 is what God does. Verses 6 through 19 is what God is like. And verses 20 through 22 is what God deserves. Okay, what God does, what God is like, what God deserves. So let's start in verse 3 with what God does. Verse 3, praise the Lord, it says, who forgives all your sins. Let me just stop there. We could, like we could camp there and literally chew on that for a lifetime. This is the greatest need any of us have, is forgiveness from God. And yet God does this for us as undeserving people. How many of your sins has God forgiven? All. Who forgives all your sins? It says, forget not all his benefits, the God who heals all your diseases. The Hebrew word for heal there can mean physical or spiritual healing. God is the one who heals in this life, and God is the one who heals for the next life for all who are citizens of the new heavens and the new earth. All healing that comes to us comes from God, who heals all your diseases. It says, praise the Lord on my soul and forget not all his benefits, who redeems your life from the pit. Does that resonate with you at all? Yeah. Have you ever been in a pit and God pulls you out? Psalm 40, you're sinking. You're in the miry clay and God lifts you up and he just rescues you. He delivers you from the pit. He redeems your life from the pit. Remember, it says the God who crowns you with his love and compassion that he lavishes on it. God does just a, give a little love and compassion over here and then move on. And, no, he lavishes this on us. Day by day, moment by moment. The praise to God who crowns you with his love and compassion that he lavishes on us. Remember also the God who satisfies your desires with not just stuff, but with good things. He's a good God who gives us good things. Every good and perfect gift comes from our good God. And why does he do these things, the psalm says? So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Now, I don't fully understand all that this means, to have your youth renewed like the eagle. I guess the picture here is of an eagle in flight soaring on these invisible air currents. So I, I, I don't know that we understand all that it means to have our youth renewed. I just know I want it. And I think many of you would desperately love that as well. And the text is telling us that the secret to having that kind of renewal is what? Forgetting not all his benefits. That's what God does. Verse 6, what God is like. What is he like? Well, he's not like us. Definitely not like us. Verse 6, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. That is such good news if you're oppressed. That is such good news if you feel like this world doesn't see you or care about your oppression. God works righteousness and justice perfectly. 
for all the oppressed. It says he made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. God reveals himself. He's not distant and doesn't want us to know. He doesn't want us to know his will. No, God reveals himself through his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. We just sang about this, did we not? 10,000 reasons. He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, will not always accuse. He does not harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Now, you may not have caught this. I didn't the first time I read this. But the people of Israel would have surely caught that that sounds almost word for word like what God says to Moses in Exodus 34 when Moses is on the mountain and he's like, God, show me your glory. Tell me who you are, reveal yourself. And God says, okay, I'll reveal myself to you. Exodus 34, 6 says God, or God says the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. So that's what Exodus 34 says says, but in Psalm 103, we get almost the exact wording, except David changes it and says, God does not treat us as our sins deserve. He does not repay us according to our iniquities. So which is right? Does one cancel out the other? Is one right and one wrong? Why is this alteration in wording so significant? We'll come back to that in just a moment. Verse 11, for as high, I love this, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. What this is saying, friends, do not miss this, is that if God has removed your transgressions as far as the east is from the west, that means they are gone. Unconditionally. They don't come back. It doesn't matter how far to the east that you get. Okay, let's, like, let's walk to the east. Well, like, let's just keep on walking to the east because you're never going to reach the west. Let's walk to the west. Let's just, I don't even know if I'm facing west, but we're just going to walk west. Actually, I think I might be. No, I'm not. Like we're walking west, and we're just going to keep on walking west until we hit east. No, that doesn't happen. There's no east pole. There's no west pole. Here's what happened. When Jesus was stretched out on the cross, what was he doing? What was Jesus doing? He was placing our sins far into the east, and he's placing us far into the west. And as a result, we are so far in the west that we can't see our sins anymore. Praise God. It's incredible. Verse 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Now, depending upon your relationship with your earthly father or fathers in your life, that may not be encouraging to you. God is not like an earthly father. He has compassion on his children. When we ask for bread, he does not give us a stone. He has compassion on those who fear him. Now, what does God know? Verse 14, he knows we are formed. He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. He knows that the life of mortals is like grass, it says, that we flourish like a flower of the field, and then where the wind blows over it, and it's gone, and its place remembers it no more. He knows these things. He knows these things better than we do. He knows that life is transitory and impermanent. We have a sense that this earth and this world is real and that the world to come is an illusion and God knows just the opposite. It's precisely the opposite way. Verse 17, but from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has therefore established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. That's who our God is. He rules over all. He's a king. That's what God is like. So what does God deserve? Verses 20 through 22. Notice the different audiences here in verses 20 through 22. Verse 20. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants, 
who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. So what do heaven and what do the redeemed and what do the creation all have in common here? They were all meant and made for the praise of God. What does God deserve? In a word, praise. All that God has made is meant to give him praise and honor and glory and to ascribe to him honor and beauty and power and worth. This text is prophetic and that we don't yet see this happening. Each and every place here in the world, not everybody in the world is praising God right now. We don't see all the world honoring him and giving him glory. But one day, every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the praise of God the Father. These are all of God's benefits. And you know what these benefits are shorthand for? If you really want to get down to it. These are actually all his benefits. The gospel message. It's the good news of the gospel. It is. It's the good news of the gospel. You go back to what I said about comparing the wording of Exodus 34 to Psalm 103. The reason why both of those statements can be true, that God does not leave the guilty unpunished, Exodus 34, while Psalm 103 says that God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. The reason why both of those things can be true and the reason that God does not treat us as our sins deserve is because God put upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. The good news of the message of the gospel, of the availability of a relationship with God and to have the rightness of God in us that makes it possible for us to experience eternal life is that Jesus was actually forgotten on our behalf. We sang about that too. The Father turns his face away. What happened to Jesus on the cross? On the cross, Jesus looked to heaven and his heavenly Father turned his face away. Jesus was forsaken by his Father and God seemingly forgot him. And the reason why God did this is so that we, the undeserving, would always be remembered by him. In other words, in order for us to be remembered by God, you know what had to happen? Jesus had to be forgotten in our place. We're the ones who should be treated like grass. We're the ones who should be treated like we're here today and forgotten about tomorrow by God. We don't deserve to be remembered. But instead, God has removed our transgressions from us and he's placed us in his family and given us an eternal hope. So what Psalm 103 is suggesting is that the main thing you and I need is though we may believe this gospel, we tend to forget it. We tend to forget all of God's benefits. We tend to forget the good news of the gospel message. We don't remember. It's not central to our consciousness. It's not central to our soul. And that has to change. So what do we need to remember? We need to always remember that we have been remembered by God. Remember this week, friends, that you have been remembered by God. And remember what it cost for you to be remembered. If you plant that thought in your soul, and you come back to it again and again and again, it's going to change you. Your experience of God is going to be off the charts. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. May my, all our inmost beings praise his holy name. Let's pray. Father, this concept of you remembering us, I'm afraid we're going to forget that. And I ask that you would help us to forget not. I ask that you would help us to remember when we are in the storm, or when we are on the mountaintop, that you are good, you are dependable, you are faithful, and there is none like you. Father, we also acknowledge that there is salvation in no one else but in Jesus. It is foolish for us to think that we can, through our own good works, 
earn your remembering us. It is so foolish, God, to think that we, by our own efforts, could earn you all your benefits. We can't do that. But thank you that in your goodness, you invite us to put our trust in you, the one who remembers us. I pray, God, that you would bury this deep in our soul and that you would awaken our soul. That we would praise you from the depths of our being with our lips, but more importantly, with our life. Father, I pray that you would rescue and save those who are lost today those who do not know you, those who feel separated from you. And if that's you today, would you just call upon the Lord in your prayer and say, come into my life and rescue me. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So confess your sins and he will cleanse you. He is faithful. If you feel that God is not being a father to you in the way that you most need right now, ask him to make himself more real to you today and this week. If you need your strength renewed like that of the eagles, tell God that. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be delivered. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be rescued and healed and forgiven. Lord, we bless you. We pray all these things in your son's name. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for this beautiful reminder. Church, let's raise to our feet and as we worship, let's take this time to Reflect and remind ourselves who He is, all that He's done.
amen. Go ahead and have a seat. And thank you one more time to Junior and the Abundant Life worship team. Thank you for having us. Well, what a, uh, an incredible bookend. As I was sitting there reflecting on, we sang, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And then uh, Steve reminded us not to forget, to not forget, to remember something like that, right? Yeah, along those lines. But since I know for a fact that I will forget, and since I know for a fact that I constantly forget all of God's benefits, and that I don't uh, re keep up to the standard of praising the Lord, oh my soul, what a great reminder that God sees us, yet not I, but through Christ in me, as we just sang. And amen to that, and we are so thankful for that. Thanks again for joining us this morning for worship as we uh, close our time together this morning. A few reminders, everything you need to know can be found at bridges.info. Quick little uh, URL, quick little link, plug that into your phone, bridges.info. You can find all the announcements, you can sign up for a newsletter. If you're new, I would love to meet you. So click that link that says I'm new and uh, fill out that info there. That comes to me, I'll shoot you an email back this week, give you a call if you put your phone number on there and see how we can be praying for you how we can answer any questions or how we can help get you connected to our community. But uh, let us know that you're here so that we can meet hopefully in the near future. Also at bridges.info, you can give securely online or if you brought a physical money or a physical check, you can put those in the boxes that are bolted uh, to the back wall. We give as an act of worship and as an act of obedience to the many ministries here locally and uh, our partners all around the world to do the work of ministry. So we thank you for your ongoing gifts and your support. And lastly, I know Steve answered every question that you have about Psalm 103, but I challenge you to think of something else. Think of a question because we would love for this to be a dialogue, not simply a monologue. We would love to answer any questions that you have. So at bridges.info, submit any questions you can think of about Psalm 103 or about faith or about the Bible or anything you can think of, shoot those questions to us and uh, Steve would be glad to answer those this week or if we get enough, maybe we'll divide them up and answer a couple questions. So I challenge you to challenge us. Anyway, thank you so much uh, for joining us. It was great to be together. Let me close us in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for this day. I thank you for your word, uh, your holy and precious word that draws us near to you. God, I thank you that we can read your word, that we can stand together as a congregation and we can recite your word together and that we can study your word and hear from it and get to know you. And God, I thank you uh, for your son who is the word. I thank you for, for Jesus who went to the cross, uh, who took our sins upon him and who, who died and three days later rose again, conquering death and for all so that ultimately we can be seen, yet not I, but through Christ in me. God, we thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you uh, that we have the opportunity to believe that your son died for us so we may have everlasting life and we can be in relationship with you. And because of that, we come together, we sing, we worship, and we celebrate you. Thank you, God, for who you are. And thank you for your son. In his name, I pray. Amen. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a fantastic week.